All right. Yes, I have a PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. And I know what you're thinking because pretty much everybody I've told that I'm having a PowerPoint are like, really? You're having a PowerPoint at church? Diane is one of them, and you're one of them. <laughs> and um, there's two reasons why I have a PowerPoint. And one of them is because Pastor Nick said I could have this laser pointer. And like, yeah, there we go. You have no idea how bad I want to point this at my son's forehead right now. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. And the second reason is because what I'm going to talk about today, I feel like is kind of complicated and a little bit of uh, pushing me out of my comfort zone because I'm perfectly fine just being like, hey, repent from your sins, put your faith in G Jesus, and then read the Bible and do what it says. But um, this is kind of going like a little bit deeper and kind of specifically what it's about is prophecy and not so much prophecy about the future things, but a prophecy that the Old Testament made about Jesus that came to pass that is when I was learning about it, it was just really amazing and just really boosted my faith and it was really exciting actually. So I'm you know, excited to share it with you. <clears throat> so go ahead and um, go to the next one for me. Yeah, go. You skipped one. Can you go back up one? You skipped one. Okay, cool. So um, what can a religious text do to prove that it's from God? Okay. Um, there, this verse in Isaiah 46 answers that question for me. It says, To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other God and there is no one like me. This is it. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things which have not been done saying, my plan will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a distant country. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it and I will certainly do it. If, God's, if, God, if a religious text makes a prediction and then it comes to pass exactly as it was predicted, that's very interesting. If a text does it many, many, many times and is accurate all those times. It's very, very interesting. And so there's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about Messiah, that talk about Jesus. And I'm just going to talk about one. Um, it's pretty cool. So go ahead and go to the next one, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And by the way, this is kind of what um, the uh, apostles did after Jesus was, was resurrected and ascended. He would, they would go to synagogues and they would read the Old Testament and be like, hey, this is talking about Jesus. You know, th and they would basically preach the gospel with the Old Testament. It's kind of weird. Like, can you imagine going to somebody and preaching the gospel just using the Old Testament? Well, that's what they did. And, um, okay. So Daniel 9, 24 and 27 um, is a prophecy that talks about things that have already happened and then also things that will happen in the future. I'm not going to talk about the things that go in the future, as I said, but so let's just read it and, and uh, go from there. Daniel 24, uh, 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And for anybody here that's a Christian, it's already starting to remind you of someone, Jesus, right? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seventy we seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, the streets shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end shall be a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. So half of 26 and through 27 are talking about the future. And if you read Revelations, words like abomination, desolate, middle of the week, these are kind of things that you'll see in Revelation. So I'm not going to really talk about that. But um, let's, let's go to the next slide and it will just review what this uh, prophecy is saying. It said that there's going to be 62, or there's going to be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then another week for a total of 70 weeks. And what I want to actually call them are time periods, 70 time periods, and you'll see why in the next slide. So there's 70 time periods, there's going to be a seven and a 62, and then there's a final one. There's going to be a command to rebuild the streets and wall of Jerusalem, and that starts the clock. Okay? That starts the clock when that decree happens. The wall construction will take place during troublesome times. This is what the this is outlining the prophecy. After the 69th time period, the 7 plus 62, the Messiah will be cut off. And he will not be cut off for himself, but for others. Okay? So that's those are the claims that Daniel 9 is making. Go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so I said that they were time periods. Okay, and here's why. <clears throat> uh, hopefully you guys can see that. But the, ter the word week um, in that verse of Daniel 9, 24 is actually, um, what's the word? Sh Shabuah. Shabuah. Which means, everybody's heard this word before, heptad. Right? <laughs> Everybody's heard the word heptad. Well, what about the word dozen? Everybody's heard the word dozen, right? Dozen means 12. Heptad means seven. Okay? So you could go to the store and be like, give me a heptad of eggs. And then the grocery, grocer would be like, okay, you want seven eggs. They, they wouldn't do that, but that's what they should do. So it's a period of seven. Okay? Period of seven. And when it's used, it's usually referring to a period of seven days or a period of seven years. Now, when they interpreted this, they said weeks. They said it's a period of seven. A week has seven days, so we're going to put in weeks. I think they should have put in heptads. Because, <laughs> um, so what, if we look at 69 heptads, that basically means 69 times 7 or 483. So it could be days, but nothing particularly interesting happened 483 days from the decree that I'm going to show you. But something extremely interesting happens 483 years after a decree. Okay, so let's just go with years. Go ahead, go to the next slide. Okay. So when I talked about rebuilding the wall and, and rebuilding Jerusalem, did anybody here go to like Nehemiah in your head? Okay, and so what about when I said in troublesome times? Did that bring you to Nehemiah even more? Okay. So Nehemiah 2, uh, 1 through 8. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. That first sentence is extremely important. It's one of those things you read in the Bible and you're just like, okay, that's interesting. But it's very, very important. When wine was before him and I took the wine and gave it to the king, now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. This is Nehemiah talking. And said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to God of, of heaven and I said to the king, If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah and to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So I, it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, 
that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of the God upon me. Okay, so there is a decree from a king that says that Nehemiah has to be allowed to get, go to Jerusalem. He has to be allowed to gather timber to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. Okay? This was, um, this, this happened. This, is, this actually happened in history. It's recorded not only in the Bible, but by historians that are not religious. Okay? And if you've read Nehemiah, you know, you, you know that it wasn't easy. Just because he had a letter from the king, it didn't mean that the people surrounding the area were like, yes, we want to support you, give you the supplies you need. Uh, the king wants it after all, so we're going to you know, make sure that it happens. But in Nehemiah, it says that they were building the wall with a tool in one hand and a sword in the other because they were constantly being raided and attacked. That's right. They didn't want this to happen. And so remember, one of the... Um, Line items in the prophecy is that the wall and city would be rebuilt in troublesome times. Okay? So this is the start. The, the clock is now starting. And we have the time of when it starts. The month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Now, Nisan is a month that corresponds to March and April of our current calendars. Just keep that in mind. And... Uh, the reason why it says it's the 20th year of King Artaxerxes is because that's how they kept uh, time back then. Like they didn't have, it's the year um, 400 BC because there was no C yet. They didn't know about that. So, you know, if I go to Colorado, if I fly to Colorado right now, I'm going to pick up two hours, two, two or three hours uh, because of the time zone change. But imagine if you were to cross borders and go into a different country and it's a completely different year. Okay, because the way they would measure years is by relative to some major event or the start of a king's reign. So the year, it's, it's the month of Nisan, and the year is the 20th year since King Artaxerxes became, came into power. Okay, so, but we're able to uh, go back because of that information and know exactly what year BC that this took place. Okay, so I have to ask you a question or a question that is going to seem really silly at first, but hopefully you'll see that it's kind of important. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And that is, other way. But what is a year? If I go on to NASA's website, there's the URL right there. Oh, I mean, you can't see it. 365.25 days is a year, okay? If you go to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, can't see it, but it's not the same as NASA. It's not. Okay? And there's a reason for that. If you go to the next slide, you would think that two technology organizations would agree on what a year is. There are multiple years that are used today. I don't know if you knew that. What we use is something called a tropical year, and that measures from the spring equinox to the spring equinox, okay? And that's 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds, or 365.2422 days. Is that what the angel was talking about <laughs> when it spoke to Daniel? There is also another year called the animalistic year, that takes into account that the fact that the earth wobbles, making the tropical year off by 20 minutes every year. Okay, so that doesn't really matter to us. We don't feel the wobble of the earth. But if you're sending things into outer space, like Raytheon Technologies does, this type of stuff is super important. Okay, so What's the big deal between 365.259636 and 365.2422? Well, over the course of hundreds of years and thousands of years, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So what, what is a year? Um, the, the Julian year was established by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, 
they said, you know what, we have figured out, and we've known for a while actually, that a year is about 365.25. 46 BC is when they officially said, we're gonna adopt that. Up until that point, they said, it's a calendar year is 355 days. And they would just throw in uh, a, uh, an, an extra month every so often to true up. And it usually took place whenever it was um, advantageous for somebody in power. Okay, so believe it or not, people use this for political gain. And then Julius Caesar said, you know what, let's stop that. But that's interesting that they use 355. Many ancient um, civilizations used 360. But there was just, you know, you had your own whatever you wanted to do. So what was the angel talking about when he said to Daniel, 483 years? So let's go to the next one. And I want to say that it's 360 days. Okay, and I didn't just pick this because it's convenient, but because the Bible actually gives evidence for it. And here are the two places in the Bible that um, gives evidence for that. There's one in Genesis, and then there's one in Revelation, so Old and New Testament. In Genesis 7, you know what's happening? The earth is being flooded. Okay, so Genesis 7, 11, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, the flood starts. Okay, gives us a specific day. That's weird. Why does it do that? On, Je on Genesis 8, it talks about the flood ending. It gives us the day that the flood ends and how many days the flood lasted. So the ark sailed for 150 days before coming aground on a mountain. This happened on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month. So we went from the second month to the seventh month, so that's five months, 150 days, divided by five is 30. 30 day months go to a 360 day year. If you like math and science, you like my message. If you don't, you probably don't like my message, but if you, if you like seeing Jesus and the word of God being glorified, you might like that too. So I think everybody likes what I'm saying here. In Revelations, John talks about a, th um, a three and a half year period. Okay, and I got, I've got the verses here. Talks about a three and a half year period. And he says how many days that three and a half year period is. He calls it specifically in the Bible 1,200 or 1,260 days. That co comes out to a 360 day year. If it was 365, he would have said 1278. That's interesting. Okay? So two places in the Old Testament and New Testament, the Bible is calling, I don't know, 360-day years. Does that mean that, that God doesn't know what a year is? I don't, that's not the point. Okay? But he's just, he's for some reason using this. So, um, go to the next slide. We have, so we have a problem here. And that's, we're using 365 point something. The prophecy to Daniel is using 360. So what do we do in that situation? We go to something that's common, and that's days. Okay, because we can see the bright sun. It goes down, it goes away, and then we see the sun again. That's a day. That's common. So we can, um, if you will, convert it to something common. Okay? So that comes at 483 years times 360 is that many days. We know when Daniel is around. That's a fact. That's a fact, Jack. All right. We know when the king made his decree. The month of Nisan in year 444 BC. You add seven, that many days to it. Where does it take you? March 33 AD. <laughs> that is so interesting to me. March 33 AD is when Jesus was crucified. That's when he was crucified. And what was one of the terms of the prophecy is that the, the Messiah would be cut off, not for himself. That is amazing to me. All right? <laughs> this, this right here made me just, I, I was just shaking my head. I was just like, you know, I've... I came to become a Christian 
because of an experience I had in church, you know. I came to church and I felt God. Nobody preached to me. I, it was the Spirit of God. But now I'm, I'm reading the Bible and finding things like this, and it's just like the puzzle is coming together. It's not just me being crazy and having this experience, but it's lining up, right? And there's so many things that point to God. It's very exciting. So go to the next slide. There was something that Jesus would say in the, in the gospel, and that was, my time has not fully arrived. You know, there was times when Jesus made the crowd so happy that they wanted to make him king right then and there. And then there were times that he made the crowd so angry they wanted to push him off of a cliff. But neither, they couldn't do either of them. And actually when he was going to be pushed off the cliff, he would just walk through the crowd and they just physically could not get him over the cliff because his time had not yet come. He couldn't, it was not humanly possible for Jesus to be killed before March 33 AD. And he had to be killed to take it a step further, by crucifixion. Because there are, if you want to look at Psalm 22, that talks about how the Messiah is going to die, why the Messiah is going to die, the, the specifics about what's happening around him as he dies. Look at Psalm 22. So, he, uh, he says, My time has not yet fully come. And when he goes to uh, Jerusalem, right before, he says, Go to the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. My time is near. I'm keeping the Passover at your house with my disciples. So Jesus senses that I'm about to fulfill the prophecy given to Daniel. And we know that Jesus didn't come to get rid of the law or abolish it, but to fulfill it. And he's fulfilling it. All right. So the last thing that the prophecy has to meet is the next slide. And that's that the Messiah was not cut off for himself. And the wonderful text from Isaiah 53 is, However, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he carried away. Yet we ourselves assumed that he had been afflicted and struck down by God and humiliated, but he was pierced for our offenses and was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment of our well-being was laid upon him and by his wounds we are healed. And all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. And one thing that we take uh, for granted, I think, is when we read texts like this that talk about how he was pierced for our offenses, we just are like programmed to think that's Jesus. But if you are a, a, a Jew or somebody not a Christian, you know, haven't heard about Jesus, these things are really weird to hear. But when you hear the story about Jesus, it's, it lines up uh, like a puzzle so well. I heard uh, going back to when Jesus asked for the, the cult to go into Jerusalem, there was a prophecy in uh, Z- Zechariah, I think, that talks about how he's going to come into Jerusalem on a cult. And I heard a story about a, uh, a Jewish boy who heard this prophecy. Okay, And at that moment when he heard that story, he just turned away from God. Okay, And here's why. He said, a Jewish boy, he said, if the Messiah is going to come into Jerusalem on a donkey or a colt, it would have happened a long time ago. You know, if the prophecy said that the Messiah is going to come in on in like a Tesla, then there, maybe there's something to look forward to. <laughs> but So he said, if, if, it, if he's coming on a donkey, we missed it. It happened a long time ago. He hears about Jesus, becomes a Christian. And it all starts to align for him. Isn't that amazing? I think that's just, that's awesome. Okay, so last slide here. There's um, not just scripture. You know, there's, you look out into the universe, it points to Jesus. There's so many things. There's things inside of you that point to Jesus. Look, look at this verse in Proverbs 30 and 4. Who has ascended into heaven? And descended, who has gathered the wind in his fists, who has wrapped the waters in his garment, who has established the ends of the earth? What is his name or what is his son's name? What a weird thing to say. And surely you know. His name is Jesus, right? (laughs) Amen. So this is it, guys. This is this is the message. This is the end of my, my presentation. But 
I, I just feel like it's so exciting to, uh, to look at Scripture that point to Jesus and how it, and this pinpoints when he's coming. And there are so many prophecies about God. Uh, there, there's things, uh, metaphors, there's stories, there's things about the tabernacle that point to Jesus that are just so deep and awesome. And um, I hope that this does for you what it did for me. And that's just really boosted my faith. It gave me a lot of courage to go out and share with people um, because I'm like, hey, this is the truth, you know. So I hope you liked it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and close in prayer. Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you uh, planned the end from the beginning and that you certainly caused it to come to pass, Father God. You are the one with integrity, with righteousness, with the courage, with the, with the mind to do it, the creativity to do it, the, the will to do it, Father. We thank you that you are our Father. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you came and you died. You were cut off, not for yourself, but for us, as we just read here, for our iniquities, for our well-being, for our life. And Lord, that is love. Love is the preservation of life. And there is no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. So we thank you for that today. And Lord, we pray that you help us. Help us to lay our lives down for our friends both in the faith and also for those outside the faith. Give us the courage to sacrifice, Father God, to go out and to preach the gospel, Lord, to go and reach the lost, Father God, as you said we should do and as if you said we will be successful at doing. Father, I thank you that it may appear that you're not doing anything in the world and that, that, that Satan is winning, but that's just not true. Father God, if we look and we see, we see that you are causing peace to go where where devastation should be, and you're causing healing, Father God, where sickness is. Father God, you are moving mightily through people, and it's not on TV for people to see, and you don't care about that. You don't need that. You just go to individuals, and in your wake, as you go by, there's peace, there's freedom, burdens are lifted off, healings are realized, Father, and we thank you for that. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Wanted those slides, they can yeah. get them from you. I can email them to you yeah, if you want. And I want to say thank you, really, <laughs> for putting in the time to put this together because it is fascinating. It is just wonderful to see the handiwork of God, to see how carefully God has put everything together, the exactness, the perfection. Yeah. And the Bible says that He upholds all things by the word of His power. Yes, he Lord. said it. He has done it. I think God does things like this. Not only the universe, but time and history. He lays it out and declares the end from the beginning. Yes, Lord. So that we know in the year 2021. Amen. He says, I've got you. You know who's talking. Amen. Who says, I've got you. You realize when he says, this is your time, you realize that nothing happening in the immediate moment of history can uproot you from what God has planted you to do. And the day and the hour, I just want to